Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Nice to see you all. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Good, good to see you all. Thank you all for coming here today. It's a very exciting... Oh, got a bit of a feedback there. Maybe I better turn my phone off. Very exciting time in British politics. Uh, and not surprisingly, really, is it? Because, after all, we have a de democratic deficit. It's not just a question now, is it, of Brexit. It's a question of British democracy. It's a question of the way the country's run. Fundamentally important issues that we're dealing with here. You know, isn't it amazing that we are here today when we should have left the European Union on the 29th of March? Let's face it, we were promised that we would be leaving the European Union over a hundred times by the Prime Minister on the 29th of March, and then we would have been enjoying the fruits of Brexit. Not only would we have control of our laws, borders and money, but we would also have had uh, the benefits economically. We'd have had the £39 billion allocated to EU to spend on infrastructure. We'd have had the £12 billion a year net, net contribution to the EU to spend on tax cuts for business and individuals. We'd have boosted the economy through that. We'd have been able to cut tariffs, which would have reduced the cost of living so that people had more money in their pockets to spend because the price of food that we don't produce in the UK would have gone down, clothing, footwear, electronic goods, and so on. And that would have boosted the economy still further and tax receipts so we could have spent more on public spending. All those things would have happened. We'd have taken control of our agriculture and fisheries. You know, those are the things that even, even our Remainer Chancellor promised would happen. He threatened us. He threatened us that we would have tax cuts. He said, beware, if you have a no-deal exit, we'd have to spend money on infrastructure. What a threat that is. I'd vote for that, wouldn't you? What a fantastic threat. So here we are, instead of that, not only we have a government that's lost the plot, if you read what was happening at the 1922 committee yesterday, it looks like the Conservative Party itself in Parliament, the Conservative Party, has lost the plot too. And we're not going to get anywhere while we have those people in charge. So it's an absolute tribute, I think, to the people of Britain that this party has become a lightning rod for the dissatisfaction and dismay that people have about the way the country is being run. Because the amount of support the Brexit party is getting around the country is phenomenal. Phenomenal. And we also have a fantastic set of people, brave candidates who are coming forward to actually stand for the Brexit party. And we have some amazing candidates, some more of which are actually being introduced today. So without further ado, I would like to introduce the chairman of the Brexit party, uh, Richard Tice, who is going to chair this meeting, but he's also going to introduce these fantastic candidates that we are able to uh, announce today. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Good morning, everybody. Can everyone hear me all right? Excellent. Well, it's, it's very good to be here and uh, here in Manchester, which, believe it or not, is very dear to my heart. I spent three very happy years uh, at Salford University just down the road, just a few years ago. Um, and I, I also um, I have the slightly interesting track record of being one of the very few people who spent a bit of time in Strangeways Prison. Um, I was a visitor, I'd hasten to add. Um, I used to play football for the university team, and surprise, surprise, we always had to play away. Um, anyway, it's a great privilege uh, to be here for the third press conference uh, where we're announcing some of the incredible candidates that have wanted to be part of this huge new movement, the Brexit Party. And it's a great honour to be its chairman. The truth is, we've been incredibly busy since we decided to launch, and we only made that decision literally about four and a half weeks ago. And in the last, uh, where are we now, sort of the last... Uh, 11 or 12 days, it's fair to say that we have achieved quite a lot. We've been quite busy. Um, you've probably seen it on social media. Uh, we've had a few small rallies. And so hopefully, uh, if the technology works, we can just give you a quick summary of what we've been up to. On the
just a quick snapshot, and uh, we've also got rallies next week in Wales, in Exeter, um, and uh, then also near Blackpool. So, uh, you know, we are going to be very, very busy during this European Parliament campaign. We know, those of us uh, who believe in this country, we know that Brexit is an incredible opportunity that should be grasped by everyone. But tragically, there is no political party except the Brexit Party who recognises the need to embrace it with ambition, with enthusiasm, with excitement, with confidence and with belief. But of course that requires something that is sadly lacking currently. It's called leadership. Instead we've been humiliated by a Prime Minister and a Cabinet that have basically in the process of trying to sell the country down the river completely humiliated us on the international stage. So we're fighting these European uh, elections, uh, this European election on the 23rd of May, and we'll be publishing at the end of today our full list of candidates. But we've got uh, six candidates here today, uh, which I think represent the quality, the experience, the success, and the breadth of people who have said, you know what, enough is enough. This country deserves so much better. And so these candidates are prepared to put their head above the parapet and to say, I need to help. I need to get involved. We need to make a difference because we need to change politics for good. The two-party system is broken. It has failed our country. It has failed us, the people. And this is a huge opportunity for change. And since we launched, it's extraordinary um, that just the enthusiasm that we have received from people all over the country, and we think that will continue. So this is a massive opportunity to change politics for good. So to our first candidates, and they're from a range of uh, the regions, and it's a great pleasure. Our first candidate is heading the Scottish region. He is uh, an entrepreneur in the care, the home care sector uh, in Scotland, um, and has got some very thoughtful ideas about how to improve that going forwards. So please welcome Louis Stedman Bryce. Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so, first of all, I'd like to talk a little bit about why I decided to, uh, to come and put my head above the parapet here and to represent the, the Brexit party. Um, so, I decided to join the party because, like many of my colleagues, I was sick and tired of you know, the way that I felt that our democracy has been betrayed by, uh, by uh, Westminster. And I'm also tired by the media's portrayal of the type of person that voted for Brexit. Um, it, it, it kind of makes me sick. And so, you know, uh, the, 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 the perception out there that is quite often that, you know, we're white, uh, we're homophobic, we're definitely racist, and we didn't know what we voted for. So I stand before you as a gay black man. <laughs> Thank you. And I can also tell you that I definitely knew what I was voting for when I voted for Brexit. So, you know, I'm extremely proud to be representing Scotland uh, as we move towards these elections. And uh, basically, I, I, I'm proud because Scotland is a place that I call my home. Um, I'm married to a Scotsman. Um, it's, 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 you know, what, what, what more can I say? I'm married to a Scotsman. Um, I'm proud to run my businesses up in Scotland where we're creating uh, employment now. We've just announced another new 100 jobs in spite of all of this chaos uh, that we're seeing with Brexit. Um, but do you know what I'm most proud of? I'm proud that I can stand with my colleagues in Scotland and give a voice to over one million people in Scotland that voted for Brexit and that don't currently have a voice there. <laughs> And I just want to be clear, you know, for the people in Scotland that uh, whether you voted to remain or whether you voted to leave, we're incredibly proud of the Scottish Parliament in Scotland. And so I will be defending the rights of the Scottish people and Scotland and making sure that we are involved in this debate moving forward. Um, 
whilst Brexit and the relationship between the, the European Union is what we're here to discuss today, I also want to use this as a platform to raise some other issues that are quite close to my heart, and that is around health and social care and the crisis that we're facing currently across the United Kingdom, not just in Scotland. And so I believe that the system that we have in place doesn't work, just in the same way that our two-party political system doesn't work, and it needs reform and it needs to be changed. Um, the, uh, a report recently from Age UK highlighted that over 50,000 elderly people have died um, recently just waiting for care packages. This is not acceptable and it needs to be stopped. So I'm therefore committing my platform as a representative for the Brexit party to push the Brexit agenda, but also to highlight some issues that are important to us closer to home as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. That's absolutely fantastic. And to hear of an entrepreneur continuing to invest, maybe thanks to Brexit, as opposed to despite Brexit, continuing to invest uh, in a crucial sector uh, that affects so many people and is, and is a growing sector. And it is, you know, to have that sort of specialism, that understanding, that experience, you know, a real entrepreneur who is prepared to say, enough is enough, I need to help, because I know how to help and reform and improve the system, and they're going to get involved. And you know, we're seeing that on a number of people uh, across a number of sectors, and that's part of the opportunity to change politics for good. So, Louis, thank you so much you. Uh, for being brave and putting your head above the parapet. Because it's difficult, folks. You know, it really is. Uh, when you put your head above the parapet, uh, we're all there to be shot at. But, you know, this is our country and we do deserve so much better. So, to my second candidate um, is, uh, is another star. Uh, she is, uh, she's a former professional opera singer. You never know, if you, if you behave, you might get a little... Um, you know, we've got all range of skills and talents here. Um, uh, she's also, uh, she spent a number of years as a fishmonger um, and, uh, and now she is a, a grassroots campaigner uh, promoting the Eurosceptic cause. She's standing uh, in Yorkshire. Please welcome Lucy Harris. Hello, hello everyone. Um, I'm Lucy Harris. Um, so um, I've run a national campaign bringing Brexit supporters and sometimes non-Brexit supporters together over a pint and a chat for three years now. I've been travelling up and down the country uh, and of course I've been in Yorkshire quite a lot. Um, and I, I know there's some people here today that might uh, have been from Yorkshire it's here to support me, which is fantastic. Um, and I've been from you know, small seaside towns to hilly hamlets, and I've met such a depth of vibrant and inspirational characters who have touched me with their stories, their histories, and their aspirations. I went up to Cumbria last February for a funeral, but to lighten the mood, I held a pub meet up there for local leave voters. To my surprise, a man walked through the door who I recognized. He was a man who had selflessly looked after my grandparents for five years, delivering their milk, stopping by to say hi and have local gossip with them, and he, they, he put a smile on their faces every single day. He made sure they weren't forgotten. And he was a community man through and through. And might I add, no amount of EU funding could ever recreate that authentic care and affection for a neighbour. He sat in the pub with me, gripping his local brew, and proceeded to tell me as what he saw a complete dismissal of our vote from ordinary people like him by the political class. His exasperation was a sentiment that is echoed throughout communities I've visited, rippling through fields to towns and across to bigger cities where I first started my Brexit journey. I traveled back to London, an unlikely source of leave voters, you might think, but beneath the surface, there are leavers everywhere. Ooh, terrible. <laughs> From teachers to media professionals to city workers, yet many are too afraid to come out as leave voters and stand up for their democratic rights out of fear of repercussions in their professional and social lives, or simply by being labelled racist or stupid by their former friends. 
In London, teachers re recount appalling stories of being forced to eat their lunch in the IT room as a punishment from colleagues. Media professionals tell of being excluded from meetings because of their vote, while freelance musicians reveal how they've been refused work due to their Brexit stance. Across the UK, many people have faced the choice of either staying quiet over Brexit or facing social ostracization. Those who are lucky enough to, be, to hold influential positions in our society have often exploited them to discredit a legitimate political stance held by their fellow citizens and indeed a majority of them. The refusal of the political class to accept the democratic mandate of the referendum has only perpetuated divisions within our country and continues to damage the valuable social cohesion. It's not just the collective political failure to respect the referendum, but the way ordinary people who support it have been marginalized and vilified. That is truly damaging to the fabric of our democracy. So today, I joined the Brexit party because it is the right thing to do. Though I may not agree with everyone I will be sharing a platform with politically, I believe democracy is the cause that trumps all others. And now it is the time for anyone who believes in it to unite around it. It is the ultimate expression of equality. It protects the voiceless, gives the opportunity for every individual to direct the future of our society and a say in how their daily lives are affected. It is the only way for us to achieve a fair and just society. But not only this, the man I met in the pub, I want to be able to have the opportunity to stand up for local people who are the backbone of our communities, my friends, my family, my neighbours and acquaintances yet to be made, people who feel they are not getting a fair hearing. People who have been denied the dignity of goodwill from our elected representatives. Those who feel their vo vote has been exploited to the ends of someone who does not represent them. But most of all, I want to stand up for people that Theresa May has failed by not withdrawing from the European Union. A promise she made repeatedly on the back of the most colossal mandate this country has ever seen. This is an incredible breach of trust with the British public. And we cannot let it go unrecognized at the ballot box. We must be bold, put our heads above the parapet and stand up for our communities and our democracy. And I invite you to stand with me and change politics for good. That level of passion, that level of enthusiasm and being prepared to stand up, put one's head above the parapet is what we must all do. And so to our third candidate who's standing for the West Midlands, uh, someone again from a, a different sector uh, with lots of different experience. He's a team mentor, uh, he's a TV pundit, commentator, he's quite hard to hold him down actually, I had to sort of constrain him to three or four minutes, he's promised me he'll be good. Um, uh, and he's also an expert in masculinity issues, please welcome Martin Daubney. Well, I find it simply inconceivable that I'm stood here today. Few from communities like mine even made it to university, let alone to have the opportunity, the amazing opportunity to stand as an MEP. So you're probably thinking, who the hell is Martin Daubney? Good question. Well, I'm the proud son of a coal miner. My dad went down the pit when he was 17 years of age and he stayed there for 47 years, digging for Britain rebuilding our country, our broken country after the war. 
My mum was a housewife who did lace work, that other great Nottingham tradition, at home, putting myself and my sister through school, living hand to mouth, and she trained in the evenings to become a teacher. That was her dream. She fulfilled her dream. She went on to work with some of Nottinghamshire's most severely disadvantaged and challenging young boys. Boys whose destiny was Borstal, prison, or worse. The most broken homes in the entire county. She then moved on to work with um, severely mentally disabled kids. Uh, a lifetime of dedication to the most neediest people in the county. And Dad gave me this work ethic, the work ethic that built this country, that unstoppable passion to work and to deliver. My mum told me education can lift us all. Anybody can fulfill their potential if they just have the opportunity. And indeed, I became the first boy in my family to ever make it to university. It was just amazing. In Manchester, here, yeah. And I spent many, many hours burning the midnight oil in the Pever of the Peak, the Lassagari, the Hacienda. What a great town. I then trained to be a journalist, and this wasn't something that people like me did. I had no contacts. I didn't have any silver spoon in my mouth. I had no mummies and daddies contacts book. I just had that work ethic and that belief, and I made it to the top of the magazine game. I became a multi-award winning magazine editor, once beating some bloke called Boris Johnson. You might have heard of him. I edited a load of magazine, The Lads Mag, for eight years. I can even remember some of it. It was a, a politically incorrect magazine from a very different era to today's joyless Twitter sphere, where saying, saying the slightly uh, most offensive thing seems to end careers, and indeed has already during this bruising campaign. So I then left my magazine when I became a father because my dad was always working or asleep. And when I became a dad, I thought, you know, I want to see my boy. So I quit. I became a stay-at-home dad, the hardest job I ever had. Forget managing 25 people and multi-million pound budgets. Looking after a toddler was absolutely nightmarish. Except it gave me the ability to look back on what I'd done. Because what did Loader do? Did it do something? We were accused of changing the way young men felt. And David Cameron, remember him? The guy who started all this, thanks, mate. He was saying at the time, the Daily Mail were, were echoing that pornography was changing the way that young men were behaving. It was poisoning them. I thought, can that be true? So I stepped back in to represent the, the voiceless, working-class men that were being attacked by the mainstream press and politicians, and I gave them a voice. I made a TV show for um, Channel 4 called Porn on the Brain where we looked at the addictive potential of porn. After that came out, it's been shown in seven countries now, the, the Home Office invited me in and said, Martin, talk to kids in schools about this, because they might listen to you. You've got a dodgy CV. You don't, you don't judge them. You're one of them. You walk the walk. I've now spoken to over 35,000 teenagers across the UK about pornography and its role in sexual content, keeping them safe, and more to the point, teaching young men how to respect women. And they won't listen to a politician. They won't listen to a vicar. They won't listen to a copper, but they'll listen to the former editor of Lowe that it finally came useful for something. <laughs> so for the last seven years, as, as Richard said, um, I've been an outspoken pundit on Sky News, ITV, Channel, 4, um, Channel 5, anywhere that I have me, basically. And I'm a vocal and committed Brexiteer, one of the few, because we hear about the mainstream media being full of Remainers and make of that what you will. I, I correctly predicted Brexit way before it happened. And how did I do that? By getting out of London, by getting away from the bubble, by not listening to politicians, clueless, but actually going to car boot sales, pubs, chip shops, talking to people in the queue at Asda. How's it going? You knew. At that point, you knew. If you listen to people, to real people, it was a done deal. Forget buses, forget slogans. It was already in my heart. I knew it was going to end. That morning, Brexit morning, I was representing Sky News on the green underneath the House of the Parliament. I couldn't even believe I was there. I didn't feel worthy. I've told you about where I came from. And I said, Brexit is going to happen today. The politicians are clueless. It's coming. And they went, oh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Even then. There was this state of denial, and it happened. I've got two kids. Independence Day was the third happiest day of my life. I was like, I remember like floating down the road, like, wow, this thing has happened. We won. Or did we? Did we win? 
We felt like we'd finally been given a voice, but it was choked. The boot of the establishment was around our throat. All of a sudden, we were being denied again. This, this, in, this compounded my feeling that I was politically homeless. I thought I was, I was born Labour and die Labour. But when Ed Miliband abandoned the, middle, the, the working classes, I abandoned Labour. My entire family went UKIP. You know, I, I was saying in London, something's happening. There, there's there's, there's a, a huge insurgence. Labour abandoned the working classes. Something needs to happen. I then, I then voted the Lib Dems. Oh, no, sorry. Um, <laughs> it's a, a moment of madness. I, I dabbled with the Women's Equality Party. I thought, why not? No, just, 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 just some, something different. But then, I re and, and by the way, I, I never voted UK. I've never voted for Nigel. No, I'm not um, one of the Farage disciples. I'm here because Brexit became my politics. The issue that transcended everything else. Just, I, didn't, I didn't care anymore about party politics. It was Brexit, politics, and who is going to deliver on that. And the answer was none of them. None of these useless MPs who don't know a real day's work. They don't understand hand to mouth. They don't understand the panic of poverty. That's something they read about. It's a concept. But it's not a reality for them. So why don't we replace these people? Why don't we kick them out? Why don't we start again? Let's start again with a, with a, new, a new wave of people who understand the real world. Sorry, I'm going to be excited there. <laughs> I've got to say, enacting Brexit now seems to me a straight toss of the coin. Do you believe in democracy or do you want to deny it? The Brexit party, I believe, is the only way of making sure that democracy is enacted. And today has been the hardest decision of my life to stand here. I'm a public figure of sorts, a small one. I'm on social media, I, I'm not wealthy. I work hand to mouth. I've got two kids, I've got a mortgage. This is a dangerous place to be. You know, careers get wrecked. I'm expecting it to happen. You know, bring it on. Just let's have it. Because you know what? I said to my dad, what do you think? Should I stand for this? And my dad is the second most committed Brexiteer I've ever met after Nigel. He said, don't do it, son. He said, you'll get death threats. It's going to destroy your livelihood. And I was like, oh, God. And then I spoke to my mum. And she said, son, you've got to do this. If you don't do it, who else is going to speak up for ordinary common folk like us? And I thought, Mum always did know best. <laughs> so today, I, I've, with great nerves, I've decided to stand for the Brexit party. Um, I just felt it was the, the only thing that I had left to do. And I'll tell you this much for free. I vow to do my utmost and my very best to get this job done, to deliver Brexit and finally give 17.4 million people a voice that cannot be silenced any longer. Thank you. You can feel, you can literally feel that enthusiasm, that passion, but also that nervousness about taking the big step. And, you know, for someone like Martin, in the world of the media, the broadcast media, you know, this is a big, big deal. And, you know, he will get, uh, he will get some grief, but he also gets huge support and respect and love from millions and millions of Brexiteers. Uh, which brings me up to my next candidate, who also for reasons that will become obvious, is also incredibly brave. We had, a, we had a few people, believe it or not, from the civil service apply to be candidates. And you talk about making a big leap, because the moment that a civil servant says that they are willing to stand up as a potential uh, candidate for, for anything, they have to resign immediately. So to have, and, and for some of them, they looked at it very seriously and they just couldn't, couldn't quite make that step. But to have someone, the head of trade, for UK trade, at the Office for National T Statistics, based in Wales, to say actually he was prepared to take that hit, to resign immediately, which he did on Tuesday, in order that he could be here today as a candidate for Wales, is really quite something something so please welcome 
James Wells. Good morning, everybody. Um, so my name's James Wells, um, and as Richard said, I resigned from my job yesterday, um, came straight up here to join the Brexit party as an MEP candidate for Wales, where I've lived for 12 years and where both of my children were born. This is a huge decision for me. Um, I've worked at the ONS for six years, and I'm genuinely passionate about my job, um, improving UK trade statistics to help and support the government as we leave the EU. However, I can no longer watch the democratic values generations have fought for ripped up and trampled over. I can no longer be content shouting angrily at the TV, watching the debates in the Commons and all the political games that go along with that. And I can no longer stand still as upstanding members of the community who I respect greatly tell me that they will never ever vote again. So enough is enough. I was actually in York for the referendum and I had an early meeting the next morning. So I never actually got to stay up for the actual results. And in the morning I saw the result and I was quite surprised. I didn't think we'd be brave enough to actually choose that. But I didn't really have any time to let that vote sink in until later in the day when I was sat down by the river. And I don't know if any of you remember the day after, it was a very, very hot, sunny day. And it was a real surreal moment. People were just going around their, their daily business as they were usually. And it, it felt so surreal that the UK had taken such a momentous decision the day before, that we were going to leave the EU after 40 years of membership to become a free and democratic country again. And that was the start of my journey, really. Um, because soon after that, I moved to head up UK trade statistics at the Office for National Statistics. And the reason I did that was to deliver a programme of improvements so that I could do my bit to support the government as we left the EU. And since I took that decision, I've watched with increasing despair, and that's the only way I can say that, at the direction our government and parliament has taken on Brexit. The lies, the deceit, the dirty tricks, and the duplicity. And I got really angry, very, very angry. And one day I went on a walk. It was a really long walk, actually. It was more of a march. <laughs> so I joined the march to leave um, for the last three days. And I met some amazing people on there, normal people like me, who had just said, enough is enough. And some of those people had walked 300 miles. Just normal people, not professional walkers, hill walkers, just normal people. They'd walked 300 miles from Sunderland to London because they'd had enough. And that really inspired me and made me think that I need to do more. I need to do more than shouting at the TV um, and arguing with, with colleagues and friends and family. So on Tuesday, I handed in my resignation from a job that I am passionate about. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a whirlwind. I handed in my notice on Tuesday and I finished at four o'clock yesterday and came straight up here to speak to you today to stand as an MEP candidate. So what I say to other people up and down the UK who are angry like me and feel that they don't have a voice is get out of bed on the 23rd of May, get down to the voting station and vote for the Brexit party. Thank you. Again, you can see hugely courageous, an incredible big family decision to take. And I would say that Wales is very lucky to have James as a candidate for these forthcoming European elections. And so to our fifth candidate uh, this morning, um, a lady who is uh, a lawyer. She's worked in a number of big businesses. Uh, she's also from a family that definitely specialises in law. Not only are her two parents judges, but all six children, so her five siblings and herself, were also trained as lawyers. That must be a, like a global record. It's just extraordinary. Um, clearly a family not to be messed with. <laughs> I 
I wonder if they get into any sort of conflicts of interest where one <laughs> child is representing one side and the other. Anyway, um, please welcome uh, Elizabeth Babaday as our fifth candidate here this morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Huh, a lot of people would wonder why someone from an ethnic minority like myself would be standing for the Brexit party. After all, one of our most vocal elective um, representatives recently called Brexiteers um, Nazis. Well, the answer is simple. I believe in democracy. I grew up in Nigeria at a time when military dictators were in charge. I remember how on June 12, 1993, Nigerians rushed to the polls, pretty similar to how we Brits rushed to the polls on June 23rd, 2016, with passion and hope, determined to change the way we are governed forever. I also remember with disbelief and dismay how the military government of the day decided unilaterally that they were not going to allow the people's vote to stand. They would not have it. And 26 years later, Nigeria is still trying to navigate itself out of the negative legacy of that undemocratic decision. It has stumbled, course corrected back onto the path of democracy in spite of a few we will not have it politicians willing to disrupt and overrun, um, overturn the will of the people. What um, Westminster um, career politicians fail to appreciate is that nature abhors a vacuum. When you get rid of democracy and the rule of law, you automatically usher in all things undemocratic the underdevelopment, social disintegration, austerity, impunity, insecurity, and ultimately, anarchy. It is, as they say, a binary choice. I have watched with other Brexiters in horror as our elective, elected dictators conspire to frustrate and dilute Brexit simply because they will not have it. This short-sighted perspective fails to appreciate that if the Brexit vote is not respected, in future, every other democratic um, decision will be at risk. Having seen firsthand what the alternative looks like, for me, democracy is non-negotiable. Now, to those who argue that the people were sold a lie, and um, this is a unicorn, well, stop crying more than the bereaved. Allow us the courtesy to decide whether we were lied to or not. Our motivations are not yours. What Ramonas failed to realize is that most of us were not swayed by the arguments two or four. We had already made up our minds long before David Cameron came and said there'll be a referendum. And um, as a British citizen working in this country and married to a Commonwealth citizen, the EU does not work for me. Thus, I find myself unable to support a system that works better for the EU citizen, giving them better rights and privileges than it does me as a British citizen. Also, as a member of the working class, issues of gender, diversity, inclusion, unconscious bias are all getting the much needed traction by internal political will. It's not just the EU, internal political will. Now we have mandatory publications of the gender pay gap figures, and banks are setting um, ethnic diversity targets for senior management positions. 
So things are gradually changing because the people of Britain want things to change. Brexit does not mean throwing out the baby with the bathwater and turning our backs on progressive workers' rights, as Labour would have us believe. In contrast, look at the EU Governing Council and associated governance um, bodies. How many women and ethnic minorities are there? We need to examine some of these false narratives and put a stop to them in light of the facts. I was told, as an ethnic minority, it is always in our best interest to vote Labour. It is time to rethink this blind group think and go back to a value-based approach. We are a value-based people. It is time for a British Blexit. I'm sure you're all aware of Candace Owen. I agree with a lot of what she says. Don't just vote for Labour because it's the black thing to do. It is time to disagree without being disagreeable. It is not the current, we don't need the current irrational, disrespectful, ranting, raging, um, shouting by those who are out of touch with reality and who don't really understand what it is to work in the UK as an ethnic minority. They seek to increase the room temperature, overheat the polity, and flam, um, stoke the flames of confusion and discord. So today, I'm standing here as a candidate for the Brexit party, and I urge everyone to come out, register to vote, choose democracy and not minority rule. Choose the rule of law and reject the analysis, paralysis, illusional dream of a labor Tory consensus. Choose the Brexit party. Again, another inspirational, passionate speech as to why democracy is so crucial and Elizabeth's own personal family experiences of that and what happens if you deny democracy is really, really inspirational. And so to the final candidate uh, here today, uh, we've got one more to announce on the screen who sadly couldn't be here today, um, but uh, is a, uh, someone who is a dentist for the NHS, is also a trade union representative for 30,000 dentists across the country, as well as also being a very almost lifelong Eurosceptic who uh, for many years was part of the Danish Eurosceptic No Movement and therefore uh, has huge experience of Euroscepticism across the whole of Europe. Please welcome Henrik Overgaard Nielsen. Good morning. My name is Henrik Overgaard Nielsen and I'm Danish. I've lived in this country for over 20 years. My wife is British and my children have dual nationality. I work as an NHS dentist and have done so ever since I arrived in 1996. I'm a European living in this country and I stand as a candidate to offer my experience about how the EU treats people with different opinions. In June 2016, I, unlike most in this country, felt that I had seen it all before. It took me back to the 2nd of June 1992, when the Danish people stood up to the might of the European establishment and voted no to the Maastricht Treaty. I was part of that campaign in Denmark, and the sense of relief in 2016 was on par with what I had felt almost 25 years before. However, the relief didn't last. What is happening in the UK now happened in Denmark in 1992. The establishment did not like the answer the people gave them, so they told us to vote again. The arguments in 1992 are absolutely the same as the arguments in 2019. The EU has a huge democratic deficit. Brussels is unaccountable secretive, 
and distant. This takes power away from people. A healthy democracy is when you bump into your elected representative in your local corner shop. Most of the people who I hope to represent cannot afford to fly to Brussels to take their MEP out to an expensive dinner to lobby them. And isn't it a disgrace that the Labour Party is in favour of this? The Labour Party, which was founded for the purpose of defending working class communities against the elite, and now we find the Labour Party siding with the establishment and turning its back on those very communities. Five million Labour League voters have been left politically homeless. And I say to those people, the Brexit Party will speak up for you. I'm European. I even have an Italian rescue dog. <laughs> I am far from the xenophobe that Chuka Omuna has claimed makes up 17.4 million of his fellow citizens. Support for Brexit is not only on the right of the political spectrum, it is across the board. And the Brexit party is a good example of that. Far-right parties do not speak for me, nor do they speak for the majority of this country. Having come here as a European immigrant over 20 years ago, I can safely say that the rhetoric which comes from those on the far right does not represent what I have experienced. Britain has been open and welcoming to me. The Brexit party brings together people from all backgrounds and challenges the dangerous stereotype which media outlets like the BBC push. How will they marry up the idea of me, a socialist, NHS dentist, trade union representative, who used to live in a commune <laughs> with being a Brexiteer? Britain is my home. I have brought up my children in this country and I have worked and paid taxes here for over 20 years. What happened in Denmark was that democracy was overturned voters ignored, and the decision of the people cast aside. And I will not let that happen to the country I now call home. The Brexit Party is the way we can stop history repeating itself. And I urge you all to sign up, support, and vote for the Brexit Party on the 23rd of May. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Henry. Again, you, you, you just can feel the experience, the breadth and the width of knowledge, but also political views here. And, and what it shows, actually, is that the world has moved on in politics. No longer is it a question of tribal issues about left or right. Actually, in today's world, it's the difference between right and wrong. And actually, the way to make this country even greater is to have common sense policies that are actually enacted by competent, capable, experienced, successful people. And I think here today we absolutely prove that. People who are prepared to put their head above the parapet with a wide range of skills and say enough is enough, this country deserves so much better. And our seventh candidate also, candidate uh, who we're just going to have a picture of in a second, is also incredibly brave. Uh, an author, but also a TV commentator and pundit, again, who will get all sorts of grief for standing for the Brexit Party as a candidate from someone from the media. Hopefully we've got a picture of David Bull about to appear on the screen. I say sort of slightly nervously um, <laughs> because it may or may not appear, uh, and it looks as though it has failed. But there we are. Um, if, you look on, uh, if you look on the internet, you'll find a picture. He's very good looking, actually, David. Um, always got a you know, very good suntan. Um, but again, uh, another candidate who is actually very bravely putting himself above the parapet and prepared to stand for the Brexit party. Um, so uh, we're going to have a... Uh, are there any questions and answers before we finish um, from anybody? Just... Uh, hi there. Hi, Simon. Uh, yes, Who, we've got Henrik for Northwest and Elizabeth, and 
Yeah, so, uh, so a number of counties for North West, as well as Wales, Scotland, and the West Midlands. Any other questions? But yes. It's just the chat from Wales. Um, what happens if May manages to buy something? Do you want to work? Um, big risk. Obviously, I've not taken the decision lightly. Um, but you know, I believe I believe in, in in Brexit, and more importantly, I believe in democracy. We've had a we had a referendum in 2016. All this nonsense about people didn't know what they were voting for is just absolute garbage to be honest with you we were told that this was a once in a lifetime generation vote and um, we were told what it meant all of the politicians now that are um, supporting a people's vote all of them said they would honor the vote beforehand and so you know I don't I get very frustrated when we're continually rerunning that referendum we've had it already and it's really really important for our democracy going forward that we honour that. I'd just like to add to that as well. I think, you know, all of us, you know, sit here and stand together with the, the knowledge that we are doing something um, quite bizarre. We are voting and working for our own obsolescence. You know, we're basically yeah. turkeys voting for Christmas. You know, we, we want to get to Brussels to, to make it over. But I think that in itself should be testament to um, the belief. I mean, what happens after that, we don't know. I mean, it may not even occur, you know, it still might get, you know, the election still may get stopped. But I think we, we have such conviction that we're, those are kind of you know, odds we're prepared to play with. Thank you. Question at the back left there. Hi. Hello. Uh, have any of the candidates been uh, members of any other political parties in the past? I haven't. No, I haven't. Yeah, I have. Uh, whole I range. Have, I have been a member in, in Denmark, but not in this country. So whole I was, range. I have. Uh, I'm... <laughs> Member. Yeah. So you've got a, a wide range of people who've either been a member of a party or never been a member of a party. And I think that's the thing. It comes back to this, mm. this issue about right and wrong as opposed to uh, tribal party. But did you want to... Yeah, so, so I was a member of the Conservative Party. I cancelled my direct debit last week. Um, so I'm no longer a, a member. I've just lost faith in the Conservative Party. I joined up... Um, so that I could support the government as, and support the Conservative Party, because I really did believe at the start that they were genuinely going to take us out of the EU and honour the referendum vote. But I've just lost, lost faith, not just in the Tories, but in all parties. And I was a member of the centre-left in, in, in Denmark. Hello. Um, yes, there was uh, um, uh, uh, an announcement yesterday by Nicola Sturgeon, and so um, uh, once again they're putting that back on the table and pushing towards it. Just at the back there, got a microphone there. Hi there, hi. Um, Nigel Farage has made a big play of targeting uh, Labour's heartlands in the North East, but that seems to be the only candidate that's not here today. I just wonder what's happened there. What, in terms of Nigel or the North East? The North East. Where's the North East candidate? No, that's a very good point. It just, um, just physically couldn't be here, uh, but we're announcing who that is uh, this afternoon. So, um, but, you know, it, it is absolutely right. I mean, you've got a, uh, a Labour elite uh, based in London, uh, led by the likes of Lord Adonis, who said recently uh, that any Brexiteer should not vote for the Labour Party. Well, there's over five million Labour voters who are now completely homeless if actually leaders of the Labour Party have said, don't vote for the Labour Party. Well, we say there is a very clear home for you, and that is to vote for the Brexit Party. Yeah. Hi. Well, my, my father was a, a dedicated uh, working-class Labour man who voted against the e EC in the first place. I didn't understand why mm. at the time I was only young. Now I understand why. Mm. What would you say to all of those people you just mentioned, those Labour supporters who work hard, who believe that's their home. You clearly have come from very different places. What would you say to those people today? Vote Brexit party. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think I think I, you I, see I, would, I would say basically if, if your own deputy leader, you know, declares that maybe maybe Labour should be a party of a second referendum, a party of Remain, and if Lord Adonis, you know, your representative down in the South West is saying if you're a Brexiteer, you know, don't vote Labour, what would that say? to five million Labour voters who also voted for Brexit. I would say, it, mean, it would say, you're not welcome, your vote is not wanted, go elsewhere. Well, where's the natural home for those five million votes? 
right here. Yeah. In the bricks before. Thank you. Yes, sir. Awesome. You're a very high calibre candidate. Thank you. Massive respect. Um, I just wanted to ask what um, what the candidates would say to those people who I've met a lot of who said, I've, I've turned out to vote for the first time ever in the referendum mm. and I've yeah. never voted before and why should I vote again because my vote was ignored last time. Those sort of apathetic. What sh how should we go talking to them? Elizabeth. I would say... Um, Sorry. What we're facing is an ex existential threat. You know, democracy is being um, trampled on and is really under fire. If you want to continue to live in a country where the say of the people matters, you need to come out and vote. If you don't come out and vote, you can't really complain about the result that you get at the end of the day. Yeah. So I want to I want to encourage everyone because you know a lot of us are Facebook social media commentators. Mm -hmm. We need to register. Can I by show of hands who has registered to vote? <laughs> Super. <laughs> so we need to speak to our neighbors. We need to speak to the people <laughs> Sorry, mate. that we meet I'm on the street. We need to speak to our colleagues. We need to speak to everyone. You came out for Brexit. Now come out one more time mm. and let's yes. defend Brexit. Yes. And I think that the right. message is, you know, you know, you may have been voting for, for the old political class who didn't do the job. We're a new political class. Yeah. We want to get the job done. We're not like them. So it's worth a second shove. But also, yeah. Let's face it, if we end up with a second referendum, it's not just a loss to us, it's a loss for democracy. Mm -hmm. And actually, we've never won anything by staying away from the ballot box. Mm -hmm. yeah. And of course, the way to stop a second <coughs> referendum is actually for as many people as possible to vote in these European elections, a much bigger turnout than ever before, so that we truly can send a very clear message back to Westminster. We meant it when we voted leave. Hello. Yeah. Um, but, you know, my family were Labour voters, two and two, mm. and every single one of them are now going to vote for the Brexit party. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Well, they're the brave ones. Last question. One more question. What I'd like to ask is, sorry, I'd like to ask Hi. is, if as we hold, a whole huge tranche of uh, Brexit uh, people are re returned to the European Parliament. What kind of message is that going to send to the Parliament, the European Parliament? To the European Parliament? Well, it's a really good question. I mean, Henry, what do you think? Because you've got so much experience across, uh, across Europe think, on this. I think this time round, actually, it's going to be an even bigger message because it's not just here that you're going to get people that yeah. are against the European super state being elected. Mm -hmm. You're going to get them from every country around Europe, probably. Yeah. And there will be a huge number of people. We might even be the biggest group in the European Parliament uh, that is against the European super state and wants to take the power back to the individual states. Lucy. Well, I'm relishing the opportunity really because um, I speak fluent Italian and I'm looking forward to giving a nice fluent Italian speech to the Italian people <laughs> to get them on side. <laughs> Vote for the Brexit party <laughs> <Yeah>. in Italy. <laughs> <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. That concludes our presentation um, of these candidates today. The rest of the candidates uh, will be um, uh, announced uh, at the end of today. As you can see, you know, this is representative of the quality of people that now want to make a difference, uh, want to step up to the plate and want to change the way this country is governed so that we truly can change politics for the good. And let's all remember, all of us spread the word, Brexit is a huge opportunity that should be embraced for this country. Optimism, hope, ambition, it requires confidence, it requires belief, it requires leadership. And what you're seeing from these candidates is actually the Brexit Party. We have that, and we're going to use it. Thank you very much. Thank you.